Hi students and welcome to another e-learning video class. This is Tony Brancatella and today we're going into consumer behavior which is module 3 and we're going to look at different aspects of this when it comes to consumer behavior. Uh, we're going to take a look at today specifically the customer, their influences and their behavior and afterwards in another video we're going to look at needs and motivations and we're also going to look at a decision making process now a lot of this information uh, will will be repeated of course in class this is called flip flipping flipping a class meaning i uh, give you the class beforehand and then afterwards we redo it in class so if you have any questions you can ask them in advance i know this one maybe i posted a little bit late but uh, we will uh, get an order and post them a few days sooner so you can take a look at them. And if you have any questions, you can ask them in class. Also, uh, we'll be giving you our, our in Google Classroom, I'll attach a, an exercise for notes, which you should be taking down uh, all, and answering all the questions in those notes. And you could use those notes at the end for your final exam, or not your final exam, but your module exam for consumer behavior. So if you have any questions, yeah, let me know. And you can write them down, and we can discuss them in class. So here's a simple model of consumer behavior. As you can see, there is a lot. There you've got the consumer purchase decision, motives, attitudes, learning, personality, perception needs that will be internal factors and then you have culture social family economic and business those would be external factors so let's put them on a list intrinsic or internal factors that influence demographics psychological economical environmental and extrinsic external factors that influence culture social classes reference groups and family so those are the real influences in your behavior or in a consumers behavior of daily purchases or purchases that they make on a regular basis or not but in today's world, the 21st century, uh, the customer has has changed a little bit. And they're much more informed than it ever before, certainly because of the internet and certainly because of all this information they get bombarded, either if they watch TV, radio, uh, or they just walk down the street so or in shopping malls. So there is a lot of information for the customer or the consumer today. Uh, also, consumers and customers today, same thing, really expresses uh, their preferences and opinions. They're not afraid to uh, share their thoughts about uh, certain products uh, either way, if they love it or they're not too crazy about it. So there's a lot of word of mouth going around and a lot of companies are gearing themselves uh, towards this because it's very inexpensive extremely inexpensive but something that we're going to look at when we get to marketing but uh, it does work both ways so they have to really be on top of their game uh, the, the companies to make sure that most of their opinions the customers opinions or word them out is a on the positive side also a 21st century very curious and educated uh, consumers and customers when they go out to buy something uh, very very curious and educated Women in the workforce, uh, as we saw uh, yesterday, uh, more and more, uh, this thing about uh, gender equality, or this lack, I should say, of gender equality is not necessarily erasing and the line is becoming straight between men and women when it comes to salary or work uh, or jobs, but uh, it's slowly, slowly getting there. And I think with all, with all that's been happening the last few months, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, sexual harassments uh, coming out and, and I'm discussing those those uh, those things and also yesterday with the mayor our first mayor here in Montreal in 75 years is a woman so congratulations to 
and Mayor Mayor Lafont for sure. So women in the workforce, a lot more than it used to be. And uh, customers today, uh, when they go out shopping, uh, certainly are more and more demanding in what they want to purchase on all the levels, including uh, quality service, certainly. And what uh, I was brought up with loyalty, even at the, in the workforce, has certainly most of it gone out of the window. So loyalty is very difficult for customers, or, or, or should I say, uh, companies to really in, uh, hold on to as they used to in the past. So it's very difficult uh, nowadays. Uh, I used to remember, I used to know a lot of people, they would buy the same car, uh, whatever car that was, they would just certainly not switch and they would be so loyal, they would even pay more for it. But this has really changed today. Autonomy also is very important when it comes to the customer of the 21st century. We live longer, so we buy more. And a phenomenon of today's world is a customer, a lot of customers today uh, do live alone, so they make their own decisions, they influence their own decisions, or they have less influence on what they purchase, and they do, in certain cases, purchase strictly for themselves. So let's take a closer look at internal factors that influence the ones we're going to look at it. I'll repeat them. Uh, demographics and demographics were uh, just to say we're going to be looking at the demographics of here in Canada, here in Quebec and here in Montreal. Psychological, economical and, and also environmental. So let's get going and look at the demographics section of the internal factors. So demographics could be uh, income, education, gender. So statistical, uh, st statistical, I should say, study of populations, including of, of human beings. It analyzes any kind of dynamic living population. It also encompasses the study of the size structure of the actual populations, not just the actual population itself. Also, the distribution of these populations, which notably cities and countries or provinces and languages too. And also, demographics response to uh, birth, migration, migration, I should say, aging, and also death. So let's take a closer look at uh, the population density or demographics distribution area, I should say, of Canada. So here's a map of Canada. This is a population density. Now, uh, Canada really uh, certainly doesn't know how to have a, uh, a density that is uh, dis distributed right across all the provinces. So as you can see here, persons per square kilometer where it's blue, you've got over 50 and all the way down to uh, a lot all sparsely populated, I should say, right up here. So as you can see, where all the people reside here in Canada, mostly right here, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. So this is called the 401 stretch. And everywhere else there is, of course, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina, Manitoba, and also the, uh, the Maritime Provinces. But everywhere else, even in Ontario, if you can see up here, there's not them, and this is Thunder Bay, there's really not that much, and a lot less Canadians live up north. Here you can see it again, also in, a, in another way, but it's the same type of picture. It tells the same, same story of the actual area itself. I'll show you another slide that might be even uh, more revealing about Canada is that 1 million people live above this line and that's it. So that's not a lot of people in this huge territory that you see here. So we're really a country that living trying to get as hot as possible and as close as to the United States as possible. Now, not necessarily living close to the United States but a little warmer down here also than up here. Certainly the temperatures are very cold. And here's another dramatic picture that really tells a story. As you can see at night, in the same kind of configuration of Canada, right here, how dense it is, the lighting here, and of course here you can see 
There is not much. There is, certainly, but not very. This is Iceland, by the way. So there's not much here also. And this is Alaska. If we take a closer look into Quebec, here again, you'll see Quebec. Uh, also the density of also Montreal and Quebec City. But also what you can see here, it's broken down also in the bilingual areas of Quebec itself. So here, Quebec's most bilingual areas are along the Ontario border, the U.S. border, South Gaspé here, which is also close to the United States, the North Coast, and Western downtown Montreal. So this is really where um, the, the most bilingual areas, not francophone, bilingual. So the rest of the province tends to have bilingual rates between 5 and 51 percent, with overall averages running between 20 and 30 percent. So as diverse as Quebec is, there's not many people living up here, first of all. And people that do live here, you can see where the bilingual areas are, are very close to our neighbors, Ontario and United States, which are primarily English. So let's look at some uh, demographics of Quebec. So the population, this is based on uh, 2014 statistics, a population of 8.2 uh, million. The official language here in Quebec is French. And the way it's broken down, francophones, 78.1% native language. 80% speak French as a dominant language. So it is pretty high when it comes to the language itself here in Quebec being French. Minority groups, allophones, we'll get into that afterwards, 12.3%. Anglophones, 7.7%, really not that much here in Quebec. Aboriginals, 0.6%. And also, another statistic is very interesting. If you speak two or more languages, only 2%, which is very revealing about Quebec. So Quebec is the only province here in Canada whose majority is francophone. And we make up 24% of the population here in Canada. So here are some more demographics about Quebec. Quebec's francophones account for close to 90% of all of Canada's French-speaking population. So a lot of revealing stuff. Don't look, take a closer look at these uh, percentages, but they're just re very revealing to make you understand that in Canada, uh, most of the French-speaking people really are here in Montreal and in the areas of Quebec City all along the river, the St. Lawrence River. So English-speaking Quebecers reside mostly in the greater Montreal area. So here again, another revealing fact, outside Montreal or outside the island of greater Montreal area, which includes Laval and the South Shore, there's really not that many uh, English-speaking Quebecers. And as you can see in Quebec City, if you ever go to Quebec City, which is a very beautiful place, and very uh, uh, historical for sure here uh, of Quebec, uh, there is not really a lot of Anglophones. Now, as tourists, certainly they have adapted and learned to speak English only because, of course, of economical, financial, or business situations. Certainly they do speak English, but they don't use it outside of work. So English speakers have dropped significantly during the past 40 years, the long historical uh, set up here about the, the Anglophones having all the power for the longest of time and certainly that has dropped off quite a bit in the last 40 years. As you can see from 13.8 percent in 51 and based on 2001 right down to 8 percent. Today it's probably somewhere around there slightly lower or maybe even a little bit higher possibly because of immigration and the refugees that have come in and do not speak French, but certainly some of them do speak more English than French. So the remaining 10% of the population known as allophones comprises more than 30 different linguistic groups. So that's quite a bit of diversity here in Quebec. So we'll get into the allophones in a minute as, as I will switch slides here. So Quebec allophones, it's usually an, an immigrant whose mother tongue neither French nor English. So the English, the term can also be sometimes used in other parts of Canada. So what it does, allophones, is parallels anglophones and francophones, which designate people whose mother tongues are English and French. 
So native speakers of Aboriginal languages are not treated as allophones. So if you want to break it down, this is based in 2011, as you can see here. So you have the French language, uh, you have, let's say, 6.1 native speakers, and the percentage of single responses, 78.1. Single responses mean they will only respond to you in French. English, half a million or 600,000, 7.7%. Uh, as you can see, it's broken down as uh, what comes third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. This has changed enormously in the last few years, and it certainly has changed in this area too. There are a lot more Persians today in the country, probably a lot of less Italians, and unfortunately, and more Chinese certainly uh, that will come into this into this province. So this is this is 2011. This if is. Uh, Hard to keep up because of the changes that are so dramatic and so quick. This has changed as we stand here today. But this just gives you an understanding of, you know, a few years ago, what it looked like. Even on the island of Montreal, if you look at this, also a very revealing map. This has changed a little bit too, but not that much. So this area here, really more Anglophone, and here a lot more Francophone. So you can see the diversity is really in the middle of the island. But on the tips of the island, you come here, more French. You will not hear a lot of English in this area. But you will hear a little bit more uh, French in this area than you would English in that area. So this has changed. The West Island this is called the West Island of Montreal. And the West Island of Montreal really is not an island. It's part of the island of Montreal is really uh, more diverse than, let's say, the East End of Montreal. So this has changed a lot more than it used to be. So you can see it right here. This is Il Bazaar, and Il Bazaar is French too. So all these areas, as you can see here, have changed and have become uh, more bilingual than, let's say, this area. So I'll show you another map, and you can see it over here also. English Montreal, a lot more has changed. English separated city. If you want to look at all the cities, different cities, what they speak and what languages they speak, you can see the diversity right here in the middle. And Montreal really has had a long history, and it's really, uh, if you look at the flag of Montreal, it really tells you a story. So here's, and it's just changed recently again. So here's the Montreal flag. As you can see, it has now, this is the new symbol. It had four symbols. Now we've much all added a four, a fifth symbol. So what do they mean? So what do they represent? I should say. What do they symbolize? So right up here, uh, the fleur de lis symbolizes French. The this is a rose. It's called an English rose, and then it symbolizes or represents the English of Montreal. Then you've got the Scottish. This is a thistle. And the thistle, just to let you know, uh, this is very revealing also about Montreal. There was a lot of Scots living here in, in Montreal. So there is a lot of history that a lot of people don't realize. But there were a lot of Scots living in here. And you can see it's represented by the thistle on the Montreal flag. And here the last one, or second to last one now, is the shamrock. This is a shamrock. And this represents also the Irish. At one time, there was a lot of Irish here in Montreal, and they did a lot, the Scots and the Irish did a lot of the work that you see when it comes to work on the roads, and also uh, all the infrastructure that you see in Montreal, the early infrastructure, uh, was really built by the Scots and by the Irish. And we just added, this is really uh, uh, warming for me because I, I, I really, uh, I, I am close to this subject about the indigenous nations, all the Indian nations here in Montreal. And, uh, they, and this represents them here, here in Montreal. So this is really an important symbol today. And it really goes out of its way than it used to be. This is a white pine. Okay, it's not white, but uh, it uh, represents uh, all the indigenous nations here in uh, Montreal. You have also, let's say, for example, Kanawaki, which is one of the nations. So. As you can see, diversity uh, really has changed in the last year. Certainly, 
this has changed a lot less Scots than, it, than there used to be uh, here in Montreal but of course this is not going to change so one day maybe possibly uh, we might add uh, you know other flags here possibly or maybe not but also what's happening here in Montreal is not just the fact of uh, symbolization or, or, or should I say symbolism when it comes to flags but also street names are starting to change and this one person uh, of course most of the streets in Montreal represent uh, old uh, uh, mostly uh, warriors or uh, army personnel that uh, have come here in the olden days and certainly Vijay is or most of them are you know old politicians well Amherst was not a very nice man uh, I'm not going to get into that story but this is really starting to change here also a lot of the streets are changing getting rid of all the uh, the certainly uh, misrepresentative uh, people and changing the names to something a little bit more in today's world so that's quite a bit of information so of course you can go back and uh, watch this video again take notes and I'm, I will repeat most of this in class this is like I mentioned is flipping the class now if you look at Montreal in the official languages is based on a census of 2011 this is besides French and English Arabic is number one Spanish Italian Creoles which is got to do a lot with the uh, Haitians Greek Chinese Portuguese Romanian which is very surprising Romania has a lot to do with uh, what happened here in 1976 with Daria Comaneci where she won the gold medals and a lot of them uh, have come here in Montreal, Vietnamese and Russian. And here is the actual percentage. Again, this is 2011 and a lot of things have changed since then and if I would put a, a new one up this certainly the numbers would change probably less Italians if you look at the uh, Montreal French demographics uh, cultural center of Quebec is Montreal French speaking Canada and French speaking North America as a whole so this is really the center so it's a very important city for francophonie which is all the countries that speak French in the world so the majority of the population here is francophone like I mentioned before this is the largest French speaking city in North America and second in the world after Paris now this is where it gets tricky when counting the number of native language language francophone in other words born here so we're still second when it comes to native language francophones but when it comes to actual populations of French speaking we're not even close so would you know what where this is this is in the Congo there is this is called Kinshasa and this is in the Congo and there's almost 12 million people in Kinshasa then you have Paris this is just French speaking not native Paris is second 10.8 and then you have Abidjan and the Ivory Coast again Africa then you have Montreal number four and as you can see they're gonna <laughs> won't be long before Dakar uh, tops Montreal when it comes to French speaking or even Casablanca so I will keep going you'll see the whole list of French speaking cities in the world and these are the top 10 so you can see most of them are in Africa and you can see the francophony world that we live in it looks like this this is all the nations that speak French or have French as their first language or they're part of the membership of what is called francophonie Canada Quebec and certainly you've got uh, France Romania is up here and as you can see most of Africa which is very surprising to a lot of people speak French including even here in Asia Vietnam speaks French now if we switch and we look at the uh, English demographics of Montreal it certainly is uh, the center of everything in Quebec here in Montreal so it's also the uh, cultural capital for English Quebec 
And as diverse as we are here, uh, we do combine both languages to make one language, and this is really not an official thing, but a lot of Quebecers uh, sont capables de parler les deux langues whenever they want. So they can switch both languages and actually even use words and, and from the English language into the French language and vice versa. So it's, in the English call it Franglish, and the French call it Franglais. So it's a combination of both languages and effective sentences, comme j'ai fait tantôt, comme je fais maintenant, thoughts and expressions, local slang borrowed from both languages. So if you hear people talking sometimes in English, and they will spread or sprinkle certain French words to represent certain things here in Quebec, and also vice versa, they will do that in French. Certainly, uh, the Bill 101 has played a big part in, in the actual uh, French or English demographics when it comes to language. So the rate of bilingualism among Fran Montreal Anglophones is estimated to be in excess of 67%. So Anglophones do speak, uh, uh, the rate of Anglophones being bilingual versus the rate of Francophones being bilingual is a lot higher. And also, a lot of uh, Anglophones do speak a third language. So there's a lot of, a, um, a lot of uh, people here, um, population, do speak three languages. So that's really the demographics that are really important to hear in uh, Montreal, Quebec, and Canada. Let's switch now to uh, the de generational uh, demographics. This is by generation. So if you look at the different generations, here in Canada, pretty much in, in North America, you've got the uh, silent generation, you've got the baby boomer generation, what we call the generation X, Y, and Z. So these are really the demographics when it comes to generations, certainly by years. So let's take a look at them in individually. The uh, silent generation, so this is groups of people born from the mid-1920s to the early 1940s. This, the name silent was originally applied to people here in the United States and in Canada. So silent generation, why are silent? Uh, before we look at that, certainly this generation, it's, you know, during the war, uh, very hardworking, and uh, they always had that uh, idea or the ideas of the actual war, Second World War in their minds. So they're very war torn and very quiet. They were silent because uh, this, in those days, the children were uh, told to stay quiet and they should not be, not be heard, seen but not heard. This was a main thing about children in those days were not looked upon as they are today. Again, this applies to people here in Canada and the US. The next one is uh, baby boomers or boomers as they're called. And this was 1946 to 1964, and baby boomers represented a lot of the stuff that happened with the uh, the different switch when it came to the 60s, and where the generations uh, certainly there was still war in those days, and it really has changed. And this is how they would look like today. So I would be part of baby boomers. So baby boomers born during the post-World War II between the, the years 1946 and 1964. Again, these numbers uh, don't, sometimes you, you know, you could be born in 45 and still be considered a baby boomer, or you could be born in 65 and also be considered a baby boomer. So their numbers really are not accurate to that uh, per year, but this gives you an idea of what they mean by baby boomers is exactly what it says, baby boom. There was a lot of babies that were born between 1946 and 64, a record number of babies. So in this also generation uh, are considered to be the wealthiest, most active and most physically fit generation compared to all the other ones. Certainly uh, you can't talk about the silent, but even going forward, this generation uh, versus any other generation before them uh, is the most active and most physically fit. Next generation, X, commonly abbreviated to Gen X, 
this is born after the world the western post-world war ii baby boomers so this of course is would be in the late 60s and all the way up to the 80s would be considered to be born be, to be considered generation x they didn't know what name to put it so easily to put it the name generation x was uh, was a, a brought up by a certain author and it stuck afterwards so generation x pre-internet certainly and but they are very quick adopters when it came to uh, to the computers they realize how important the computers were and they adopted it very well and they're also very good at the work-life balance stress levels they understood a lot of these things and how to uh, to look at both sides of life and also considered to have a very flexible lifestyle as we can see this a lot of divorces happen in generation X a lot of single parents also next generation is generation Y or Millennials as they're called they're born between 1980 and 1995 again here uh, the years if you're born 79 you can still be considered you know generation Y so coming of age 1998 and 2006 that means 18 years old and as a current population of 71 million here in North America. Uh, Generation Y are more racially and ethnically, uh, ethnically diverse. Uh, certainly the immigration is a big part of it. They uh, were the first ones to really get into the internet and learn about the internet and uh, understood what it was. And so they played a big part in the growing of the internet itself. And Generation Y often raised in dual income or single parent families, like I mentioned before. This is where the actual styles of living started to change. And this was a common and more accepted than it used to be beforehand. So if you want to compare Generation X and Generation Y, here are some factors. I'm not going to read them all, but you can pause and take a look at it and understand what this means. Generation X, just a couple of them, uh, more considered to be in the PC era while this there was no actual internet in 76 77 78 here in 77 even in higher the internet started to come into play so it really has changed for that too the last generation is generation z so generation z born between 1995 and 2012 this is coming of age between 2013 and 2020 they're really ruling, starting to rule the world. As you can see or hear, a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs of today were, are born in this generation. So this is certainly is growing, but it's not as big as the baby boomers. I want you to note that baby boomers was a lot higher population of babies born than today. As you can see, it's a lot less than it was in Generation Y. So very highly diverse environment will make the grade schools the next generation the most diverse ever. Certainly they are looking at life a little bit differently than their previous generations. Very highly sophisticated when it comes to media and also computer environments. So they're born into the world with computers in their hands. So for them, it's they don't know this what, what it is like without a smartphone or a laptop, let's say or the internet so very tech savvy and experts when it comes to uh, the internet more so than even generation Y and even before then so they're really it's a it's it's their lives it's really not considered to be hey we've got something new here like in my life uh, when it came in wow this is fantastic why didn't I have this when I was growing up uh, they have it and that's it so it really changes everything so here is uh, some examples also when it comes to uh, comparisons. This is coming of age, born between 1981 and 1995, 16 to 29 years old, right? They, uh, they live with this when it comes to 9-11. They live with Facebook and also all these things, global warming. But in 61 and 1980, a little bit different. Cable TV started to come into prominence. There was the, ap the epidemic or the, the start of uh, certainly AIDS, video games also. So video games has really changed versus today. So 
So if you look at uh, also Y and Z's generation, uh, technology oblivious versus adopters. Millennials have grown up during the internet revolution. Every aspect of their life is entwined with the technology, while Generation X grown up as technology emerged, need to learn how to use it. So it was really a different way, approach of life when it comes to uh, the internet itself. And when you look at gender differences or versus gender e equality, millennials today, uh, for millennials, gender equality is a given. It has to be the same thing. There is no question that it has to be different. It has to be the same. While Generation X celebrated gender equality. So in other words, it was just starting to come into play and a little bit more about women's power and uh, uh, eliminating this, this thing about men and women in language, in, uh, in culture, in everything. So the impact of demographics between the millennials and Generation X. Here, millennials, largest generation since the boomers, and Generation X, a very smaller generation uh, when it came to population or growth. So it makes a big difference. And even in factors of uh, authenticity or cool, millennials, authenticity, authenticity is the new cool, while Generation X are more likely to be concerned with cool and then everything. Very exclusive versus true to self. Who am I really? Versus uh, making myself up to be somebody else. So this is really a big factor also. Also another one, this is very interesting stuff. Heroes versus rebels, combination of a crisis and opportunity creates a generation that considers themselves heroes uh, when it comes to saving the planet versus uh, a generation where a combination of disappointment and fragmentation create a generation that consider themselves rebels. So it's a totally different approach to life. In today's world, uh, this does not exist for Generation Z. And if you look at uh, future pressure versus peer pressure, uh, global study by MTV Reveal the summer, the number one concern of millennials relates to the future and achieving their ambition versus Generation X were defined by peer pressure. Peer pressure meaning pressure put on by your friends and certainly by your family, by schools, and so on, and by society. So uh, generation, the millennials, generation uh, Y certainly does not follow what Generation X used to follow. Even when it comes to health, millennials are the most health aware generation today, even more so than the baby boomers. And Generation X, well, not, not as much. So I hope that gives you a little understanding of what's happening today when it comes to the different generations and thoughts. Certainly today's generations, uh, there will be a new generation that will follow the millennials, certainly. And when, it, when that does, they will be, again, uh, have different, uh, uh, different points of life and different direction in life than, than the previous generation. Now, of course, certainly the past generations have adopted, certainly baby boomers have adopted, maybe to be a little bit more like the millennials or you know as the generations went through certainly you know we 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 went as baby boomers through generation x we were more adopted to be like them and certainly today we look at the millennials and what they find that's important and we say yeah that's true we we consider that to be extremely important and of course the internet is part of all generations lives more and more less than the silent generation but baby boomers have really adopted that too so a lot of these stuff that you hear about different generations uh, has, you know, intertwined and has really been diverse. The, uh, let's look at the next one now, and that would be psychological. Psychological, you have uh, perception, learning, attitudes, motivation, personality, and values. So let's look at perception. What is perception? Perception is how we organize, understand, interpret the world around us. Now the important one here, of course, is interpret. How we individually see the world around us. So what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we smell, 
what we taste. It's all different and it's all our own. So consumer behavior plays a big part here because how uh, do uh, stores or how do companies or how do brands uh, attract all these different individual aspects of uh, human life? So perception operates in all aspects of our life, personal, social, business, life also. So not only that uh, we have all these different perceptions, but we do have different perceptions in our daily lives. And if we split our daily lives, like I just mentioned, personal, social, and uh, business or workplace. So another graphic here to show you what is perception. If you have your foundation of what we think, what we say, what we do, and how we are perceived. So if you look at perception in business, which is very important for this course when it comes to professional sales. So perception in business is very real, very reality oriented and not very idealistic. So again, uh, perception is very formal. The essential part of one's package of business skills, the more formal and real you are when it comes to a, a workplace or in business, more successful you can be and also in business you can have a better understanding of what the market will develop and how it will develop in the future so if you look at the different the generations the Millennials are certainly very realistic when it comes to business so their perception is uh, is really made up for today's world and also perception you identify with major trends that impact society, how we see different different uh, trends and, and the world is going to. And now uh, more and more as we hear in the news about uh, the trend of, uh, of, of gender equality uh, really becoming something in common and in, the, in the workplace and in life where uh, even the using the phrase gender equality will certainly one day disappear and men and women will be on the same level. Certainly, if that happens, there's a lot of things that will change in life and how we see things, and maybe population might go down. We don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's something really interesting that uh, will happen in the following generations. So perception at work, uh, how do you see a job? Is it just a job, or do you see it as an aspiration for the future of your life? So. Here again, different individuals see this both way, one way or the other. Or one day, when they're younger, they probably just see it as a job, or vice versa. When they get older, they just see it as a job, but at one time in their life, they probably saw it as a career aspiration. Also, personal problems plays a big part when it comes to perception at work. Cultural differences. And the exercise that we did when it came to teamwork and management plays a very big part. And we saw that exercise and it was really interesting to, to see you in that exercise when it came to teamwork and how you manage the group individually. You saw that everybody was different and everybody did not do the same thing when it came to teamwork. Next one would be learning. So learning can be defined as the process leading to relatively permanent behavioral change or potential behavior change. So learning, of course, it uh, certainly has to do with development. So development of preferences, what we like, what we don't like, what we did like one day, we don't like today. So we learn certain things and we change. Experiences play a big part, be it positive or negative. And we really strong, we're really strong when it comes to repeat positive experiences. Now this phrase here certainly epitomizes everything that has to do with brands today, companies. Uh, you know, I mentioned Amazons and the Amazon of the world and all these big companies. Is what they're trying to do is to repeat positive experiences. So when, when it comes to learning uh, in your perception of it, really heads you, or psychologically I should say, heads you into buying that product or from that brand over and over again. 
So what do we learn? We certainly don't like negative, uh, negative ones, negative experiences, and memory certain plays a very big part when it comes to what we buy. Next one would be attitude or attitudes. So this is learned tendency to evaluate some object, person, or issue in a particular way. Of course, this is very individualistic. So can you predict behavior from attitude? Sometimes our behavior is different than our attitude. Sometimes our behavior influences our attitude. Closer look at attitudes. This is a composite of a consumer's beliefs of the product, what the product is for them, how they feel about the product, and what's the behavioral intention towards a product? How do we behave towards, or what's the intention of this product? This is all mishmash together the actual attitude. So together they represent forces that influence how the consumer will react to the product. So if we look at it this way, attitudes we have beliefs, affect, feeling, and our behavioral intentions. So if you break them down and you look at attitude beliefs, consumer may hold both positive beliefs towards an object, let's say coffee tastes good, as well as a negative belief. Coffee is easily spilled and stains papers. That's a negative belief. And also some beliefs may be neutral. Coffee is black. And then uh, also uh, beliefs that consumers hold need uh, not be accurate. So is coffee not good for you? Is coffee good for you? Some people think it does. Some people think it is and some other people don't. So behavioral intentions, what the consumer plans to do with respect to the object, buy or not buy the brand. Consumers often do not behave consistently with their attitudes for several reasons. One of them is ability. He or she may be unable to do so. Competing demands for resources. What to buy with limited resources? What can you afford? And the influences of society, social influences. Student thinks that smoking is really cool, but since his friends think it's disgusting, he does not smoke. So this is just an example that possibly you're influenced by other, other, uh, other people. And also measurement problems. So measuring attitudes is difficult. It is not something that you can say, well, this person has this type of attitude, and you can, you can write it down and compare it, that attitude to someone else or find two people uh, in this world that have this exactly same attitude. It's very difficult to, to measure. And this is what makes it very difficult also for brands and companies because of this. It's very difficult to group people when it comes to attitudes. So moving along, I know this is a longer video than usual, but there's a lot of information here. I'm hoping that you find this very interesting. So next one is motivation. So motivated by many things, some positive, others not so positive. It also can move people only in a short time, like hunger could be a motivational factor. Others can drive a person onward for years. It impels to action, motivation. This is where we hear this so many times, self-motivation. Like I mentioned, you're actually saying, motivation motive it's not something that you can uh, get from somebody else not, not anybody else could motivate you you're the only one that can motivate yourself so it really impels you for action so i can't grab you by the shoulders and say hey, you gotta do your homework today and and this is the reason why and so on and so forth still if you don't actually do it uh it's not going to be done so the only one that can impel into action this is why motivation is really just you that can do that because you're the only one that actually could do the action of homework or you know going out on losing weight stuff like that running whatever it is the only action the only person that can actually do the action is you uh may maybe to uh, minimize physical pain and maximize pleasure we certainly as human beings do not like physical pain or some people this world like physical pain but most people do not like physical pain and we like to maximize our pleasure. And of course, this plays differently on everybody else how to maximize pleasure.
Also, specific needs such as eating and resting or a desired object could be very motivational. This plays a big part in uh, when it comes to uh, a consumer behavior. Next one will be personality. So personality, very quickly, inner psychological characteristics that determine and reflect how a person responds to his or her environment. So if you look at the nature of personality, personality reflects individual differences, personality is consistent and enduring, and personality can change. So certainly a personality now is somewhat different from when you were seven years old, and it will change over and over again, depending on what your, your environment has done to you and how you, change, how you see life around you. Next one is values, so fundamental beliefs of a person, knowing what is right or what is wrong. Core values about life, a belief that family is a fundamental importance. Do you all believe that life or family is a fundamental importance? Some people don't, so their values will, will vary uh, when it comes to this uh, thought. Also, a belief that honesty is always the best policy and that trust has to be earned. And values are not necessarily always positive ones. So some may be driven by self-interest or greed, narcissistical, we talked about passive aggressive people, uh, sociopaths and all that. Certainly their values certainly strike you different than your own. So there's many aspects of values in life when it comes to, uh, to that and lifestyles. So as you can see here, a lot of values or a lot of different things come into play when it comes to uh, your different aspects of uh, motivation, personality, all of these entwine together. Next one would be lifestyles. So lifestyles, a way of, um, of living of individuals, families, and societies. This is expressed in both work and leisure behavior patterns and activities and reflects people and also how they see themselves or how they have a concept of themselves. So the way um, they see themselves and believes they are seen by, by others is a lifestyle, is a composite to hear of motivations, needs, and wants. So this is a whole mishmash of different uh, composites that make up lifestyles. Here again, brands or companies uh, do look into lifestyles and try to group people into lifestyles when it comes to uh, trying to reach them with their products. So this is a easier thing to do than let's say attitudes. So lifestyles uh, influenced by factors such as culture, culture, family, reference groups, and social class. If you look a closer look at lifestyle, you've got personality, attitudes, class consciousness, purchase importance, and also perceived risk of buying that product. The next one would be economical. So this uh, is certainly one that uh, companies are easier to uh, reflect on and to uh, have a better understanding of, uh, of groups and being able to reach groups with money. So in Quebec here, personal revenue uh, in 1981 was on average $8,000. In 2012, it's gone up to almost $30,000. And I would imagine that it's above that today. And you can see our groups here from 2009 all the way up to 2013, the actual population under five thousand dollars say this is the actual population of those years here in quebec so under five thousand under five thousand dollars in 2009 half a million people were making less than five thousand dollars and and also in 2013 this has gone down to or it has pretty much stayed the same when it came to five thousand dollars and if you go all the way up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars here in quebec there was 26,000 that were making more than $250,000. And here again, very relatively the same. So as you can see on the average here of 35 to $50,000, uh, 
again, the population uh, variances has not really changed. And this is what really, uh, when it comes to advertising and reaching consumers, is one aspect that companies really work on. As you can see in the last few years, it hasn't really varied. So they know where they're looking for. As you can see, the break from $15,000 dollars or and all the way up to fifty thousand this is the prime uh, area where cons where companies really try to reach consumers it's very difficult to reach consumers here or here only because of the of the numbers so economically uh, personal revenue like I mentioned is also your Purchasing power. Now, the purchasing power is the value of a currency expressed in terms of the amount of goods or services that one unit of money can buy. So, importance because all else being equal, inflation decreases the amounts of goods or services you would be able to purchase. So, purchasing power is not necessarily your personal revenue. The other aspect is borrowing power. So these are, this is economical. This is where really a lot of companies really do a lot of research on and really strive to reach consumers. So as a rule, let's say, if income rises at the same rate as inflation, consumers can maintain, uh, let's say, their present standard of living. So if, however, income rises faster than the rate of inflation, the standard of living will improve and vice versa. So if inflation rises faster than income, even with wages and salaries also increasing, then the standard of living will decline for consumers. So this plays a very big part when it comes to purchasing power. One more is the environmental aspect. Well, today, as we mentioned before, about consumers being millennials generation are very conscious of the actual environment. So this plays a very big part. And also the media plays a big part. We hear a lot of uh, politicians saying that there is no issue when it comes to environmental or, or what's happening with the ozone layer and all this. But a lot of people still believe that this is true. So media exposure plays a big part in how we see the environmental. So product exposure also. Uh, safer products we're looking at versus in the past. Uh, how are cows fed? How are salmon fed? Where do they exactly, or even the chicken, how are they taken care of? Uh, even we look at what's happening today with the, with the Canada goose when it comes to their coats and jackets. Uh, their goose feathers is a big story that just came out and how the goose are actually treated or maltreated. Uh, a lot of people will not buy that product anymore because of what's happening to the goose or to the geese. Sustainability, how we look at the environment, getting away from coal or, or pollution, uh, getting try to getting into certain other different types of uh, options such as solar, let's say. Organic is a big story today also that we're looking at uh, more and more when it comes to uh, the environment so those are the internal factors that influence consumer behavior let's quickly look at the external factors uh, that influence and let's look at the culture now I will pass on quite a bit of information here and uh, do pause the screen to look at it and to write to write down your notes as I mentioned when it comes to this uh, and also keep an open understanding of, uh, of how much information I'm trying to pass on to you. And I'm not really expecting you to know all this stuff by heart and to understand it. But this is really just information uh, about uh, influences when it comes to consumer behavior. So keep that in mind as you watch this. I do put a lot of information up here on the screen. So the main external factor is culture, social, social culture. So this is influences consumers through the norms and values established by the society in which we live. So certainly uh, most of you or a lot of people that change uh, their culture, change their society, have to change also or look at closely at the culture that's, 
the culture that surrounds them and how they perceive it and how they interact with that different aspect of culture based upon where they're from and where they are today. So this is a broadest factor that influence consumers' behavior. So this is, plays a very big part. So here's a new word for you if you have never heard this word before, inculcated. This is something that uh, most of us are where our culture is passed down from one generation to another. So I'm Italian, so the generation of Italian or culture of Italian culture has been passed down to me and also through my family members and through my religion. So this is very something that is in us and will not go away. For some people they will. They will change their they will change their religion or when it comes to just detaching themselves from their family so they will be uh, less inculcated than let's say some other people. So culture, really a complex whole that includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, all of these things, customs, and any other cap capabilities or habits acquired by humans as a member of society. So this really uh, plays a very big part when it comes to uh, brands or companies trying to get into cultures to, to sell certain products and how they change uh, certain products for that culture. So if you see certain products, even let's say uh, Coca-Cola, the way it's sold here versus the way it's sold in say in Japan or even in the United States or in other countries is different. So they, they do a lot of research on this just for this aspect. So certain characteristics of culture, I'm not going to go through them, you can pause the screen and read them. I'll just read the bold. Culture is invented, culture is learned, it's shared, it satisfies needs, it's very similar but also very different and it's not static. Culture uh, do not ch do, do change gradually and continuously. These change however may be very slow and very fast so they will change that way. Here's some information on subcultures. So a subculture is a segment within a culture that share a set of meanings, values and activities that differ in certain aspects or respects from those of the overall culture. So let's take a closer look of uh, our examples of uh, subcultures. So you'd have uh, different religions, people, different ages. These are all parts of subcultures. So another external uh, factor that influence would be social class. So this refers to uh, people standing in society and class-wise and determines by a number of factors, education, occupation, and certainly income plays a bigger factor than education or even occupation. So measured on the basis of wealth, power, and prestige. And while income is an important indicator of social class, the relationship is far from perfect since social class is also determined by where you live, the cultural interests, and also your world views. So here's some more information about social class. So just quickly, a consumer's social class refers to his or her standing in society it is determined by a number of factors, including education, occupation, and income, like I mentioned before. So social class categories, you can easily categorize them in upper, middle, working, and lower class. Next factor, or external factor would be reference groups, serves as a point of comparison for individuals, serves as a frame of reference for individuals in their purchase or consumption decisions. This is a very important term here, frame of reference. I will not go into details about this, but you certainly should Google this and exactly what that means when it comes to reference groups, culture, and all of that, social groups too. Now, this, this term is really important. So presumed perspective of values or values are being used by an individual to make decisions. 
examples shopping with friends family or even for your educational purposes so primary uh, inf informal groups would be family peer group and friends and formal ones would be where you work and also the people you work with so here we can take another look at reference groups broken down group types described born into family gender and social class aspirational like to be like to belong this association hate to belong so these are all types of reference groups that you can look at so here's a little bit more information about reference groups and also the nature of reference groups the norms the values socialization status and power and the roles. so roles are functions that individual hold in the actual group Values are shared beliefs among the group itself. Uh, norms are generally rules and standards of behavior. Again, just to repeat, so this is family, external factors that influence, a group of two or more people related by birth, marriage or adoption, household is a family, an unrelated person residing in the, in the same family. All families are households, but not all households are families. Here is a graph, the functions of a family, and how it, the, main ask, the main function of a family is to provide. If you break it down in the life cycle stages, I repeat this, the bachelor stage, newly married, full nest, empty nest, that means, that means the children living with the family, all the way down to sole, survi solitary survivor. And here you can see how income is needed and how expenses are, are used so in bachelor stage uh, income and expenses are low but as soon as you get married certainly both are high all the way down to when you're single and uh, alone your income and expenses are lower and uh, a last one we're going to get into decision making later on a little bit more information about that but just to give you an understanding here a little bit how in families decision makers uh, decision making goes on just this part is really important about parents and children are decision makers but the actual purchases are just the parents but the users can be the parents and the children so having said that and this is a very long drawn out um, video or lesson uh, quite long versus the other one but there's a lot of good information here that's going to be on the BIM exam and if you have taken down the notes if you haven't taken down the notes uh, uh, on this post uh, do do take them in class and uh, do uh, have a good understanding about about this and when it comes to factors that influence internally or externally great so if you have any questions on this I will repeat most of this in class not all as you can see this is very long I will repeat this in class and if you have any questions bring them along and on the papers that I will give you for the exercises, do write your notes that you think are, are important and that you could use when it comes to the final exam. Great. Thank you and see you later.